Hello, everyone. Welcome back to freepilotgroundschool.ca. This is our sixth lesson on airframe engines and systems. We will be discussing the fuel system and fuels. Talk about some different types of fuels. First off, uh, gasoline is a mixture of octane and heptane. Octane is an eight carbon chain. Heptane is a seven carbon chain. Uh, octane burns slower, which is a good thing than heptane. It's less volatile. Uh, and the grade refers to the octane ratio. So for example, 93 octane is 93% octane and 7% heptane. It's going to be a higher quality gasoline uh, than let's say 80 octane. And of course, 100% octane uh, the best. Uh, these days, all that's uh, left of the different types of aviation fuel is 100 LL. LL stands for low lead even though low lead still has far more lead in it than leaded gasoline did in uh, vehicles from decades past. It is a blue color. Uh, probably 30 years ago, I still remember they used to have 8087. That was a red color. Uh, there was also 10130, which was a green color. Jet uh, fuel is straw colored and it absolutely cannot be used in a piston engine. Uh, jet fuel is uh, pretty much the same as diesel fuel or kerosene. Obviously, you wouldn't want to put diesel fuel in your uh, gasoline powered uh, truck. So uh, same goes with airplane. Uh, the general rule is you can always use a higher octane fuel. You can use 100 LL fuel for an engine that's designed for 8087, but you can't go the reverse. If an engine is designed for 100 LL fuel, you can't put 8087 uh, fuel in it. Avgas weighs six pounds per U.S. gallon or 1.59 pounds per liter. Jet A is seven pounds per U.S. gallon or 1.85 pounds per liter. Uh, these will come up often, these numbers, when you're flight planning. Uh, you look at your fuel slip, you figure out how much fuel you put in the airplane, then you calculate how heavy you are so when you're doing your weight and balance. There's some additives that are added to aviation fuel, such as preservatives, because airplanes do not uh, fly as much as cars drive. So they don't go on a daily basis. The fuel in an aircraft may be sticking around a lot longer than the fuel in your car. So they do want to put some preservatives in there. They put lead in there to prevent knocking and improve lubrication. There's anti-icing uh, compounds to prevent water from freezing in there and uh, lead scavenging additives as well. We haven't seen the boring stamp in a while and I thought this was probably boring. So I, I threw it in here now. Let's talk about a fuel contamination. The most common contaminant is water. Uh, this, contrary to popular belief, is usually caused by leaking fuel caps. Usually what you hear as well, condensation in the, uh, in the wing tanks will create water in there. And yes, that is true, that will happen. It will be a very small amount of water. But if you have quite a bit of water in your fuel, the, the first thing I would look is, uh, how are the uh, seals, the gaskets on your fuel caps? This contamination generally settles to the low point in the tank and we dip or we drain the tank and look for water and other contaminants uh, prior to flight, part of our walk around. On the left, we see some water and on the right is some gunk, it looks like water mixed with mud or something like that. Uh, if you do find water, you just keep draining a little bit at a time until you've drained all the water out. Let's talk about fuel tank location. Uh, first off in high wing aircraft, uh, the fuel system is typically gravity fed and the big advantage of gravity fed fuel uh, systems is you don't need a pump. Pump doesn't matter uh, if it fails, you just don't need one. It just naturally uh, goes from the fuel tanks to the carburetor. On low wing aircraft, we require a fuel pump system. This is a system where we have a pump or a series of pumps that provide pressure to suck the fuel from the low wing to the engine. Typically, there is a mechanical fuel pump as well as a backup electric pump in case the mechanical fuel pump fails. One other thing that you will find in a low wing aircraft is typically you only have a left or right fuel selector, you don't have a both setting. And the reason for that is because if you had both, you'd end up or you have the potential to start sucking air from uh, the pump. This is a super important topic when we discuss the fuel system, and this is venting. So when fuel comes out 
of the tank and goes into the engine, it has to be replaced with something. It has to be replaced with air. And if it's not replaced with air, then what ends up happening is you end up with slow fuel starvation. And one of the things that can happen, and I've had a number of issues on aircraft with the fuel venting system, sometimes you'll get sand loss to some insects. To They start filling, a, they make, build a nest in the fuel vent. You don't really notice unless you look at the fuel vent closely and make sure it's clean. And then what happens is you go flying and everything's going well, and then you start creating a vacuum inside the fuel tank. And because of that vacuum, you have less and less fuel going to the engine and you'll have a very slow progressive power loss. So it's very important that you make sure that those fuel vents are uh, clean. Sometimes on a hot day, you'll end up filling the tanks. And uh, as that fuel expands, uh, some of the fuel will come out that vent and it will drip. So typically I only fill fuel tanks full uh, when I'm about to go flying, just to prevent that, especially on hot uh, days. Fuel lines are typically made of soft 1100 uh, grade aluminum tubing, typically 3 8 uh, inside diameter. And uh, there are also fuel drains at the low point in the fuel tank. You'll see on the left under the wing, let's say on a high wing Cessna, as well as there's usually one right by the uh, fuel bowl, a fuel strainer uh, in the in the engine right before the uh, carburetor. You want to drain these every day before you go flying. The induction manifold uh, is a series of pipes that moves the fuel air mixture from the carburetor to the uh, intake uh, port, induction port on the uh, cylinder. You can see here, this is an uptake type carburetor. The air comes in the front, goes through the carburetor, goes up, and then goes along the different uh, induction manifolds. The number of problems uh, that can occur due to fuel, uh, the first one we'll talk about is detonation. So fuel should actually burn, not explode. It, uh, if it explodes, then we have what's called detonation. And uh, you kind of hear a, it's kind of a loud uh, banging uh, sound. Causes of detonation are typically the incorrect fuel, so too low of an octane and it tends to explode. If you overheat the engine or have too lean of a mixture, you can also cause detonation. If you suspect detonation, uh, you should uh, put the mixture full rich or make sure you use the proper fuel next time you go flying. Uh, vapor lock is caused when gas at higher temperatures and low pressures vaporize in the fuel line, blocking the flow of liquid fuel. This is a very common problem in fuel injected engines when they are warm and you're trying to start them. If this happens to you in a fuel injected engine, you wanna make sure that you're very familiar with the hot start procedure. Typically, the hot start procedure is having the mixture at idle cut off and the throttle in. Uh, when the engine starts firing, you push the mixture rich and pull the throttle idle. The other thing, you can run the electric fuel pump to clear any uh, fuel in the, or any vapor in the fuel lines. The primer is a, a small mechanical fuel pump used to assist the engine start. It sprays uh, fuel directly into the intake manifold. One important thing to remember is that it has a lock on it and this lock must always be engaged when you're not using it. What can happen if you don't have the uh, primer locked, it can work its way out and then eventually, let's say, or work its way back in and now you're spraying raw fuel into the intake manifold causing an excessive amount of uh, or an excessively rich mixture. The other thing you need to be uh, worried about, or you think about anyway, is during the winter, you might have an art, a hard time starting the engine. And so what a lot of pilots do that aren't too familiar is they try to start the engine, engine doesn't start. So they put more prime in it, doesn't start, doesn't start. All of a sudden they flooded the carburetor and you can actually see from underneath a bunch of fuel puddling uh, underneath. And then they, uh, They've pumped fuel through the carburetor. There's fuel on the ground, fuel on the landing gear, on the nose gear. Then finally the engine fires up and uh, a spark from the exhaust ignites that fuel on fire. That fuel travels or that fire travels up the soaked, the fuel soaked landing gear and into the engine. Now all of a sudden you have an engine fire. So uh, just be aware of that in the winter, not to over prime that engine. There's a few uh, really important guidelines for 
managing your fuel when you go flying. First off, you have to know your aircraft's fuel consumption. Uh, this just comes from being familiar with the POH, but you should also be familiar from flying the aircraft regularly. Uh, when you fuel up an airplane, let's just say, figure out how much fuel you're putting in and how long you've been flying for, and then you come up with what's called the block fuel flow. Because although the uh, POH numbers are accurate, they assume that you're going somewhere. You take off and you're going somewhere in a controlled manner. But let's say you're doing circuits. Well, you might use more fuel in the circuit because half the time you're climbing at a high power setting. Uh, same thing goes, let's say you're doing aerobatics or flying, float, uh, flying floats where you might be flying low with a, a rich mixture. Prior to flight, you also want to know how you also you want to know how much fuel is in each tank. You want to know both the number of gallons and the time. So typically, I will ask a student, I say, how much fuel do they have? Do you have? And they'll say three quarters. And I said, so how long can we go flying for? And you want to be really familiar with that. Don't just think, oh, I have three quarters fuel. Think, I have three hours or two hours to fly before I need to be on the ground. You also want to visually check, dip the tanks prior to each flight because fuel gauges in aircraft are notoriously unreliable. Another important thing is if you're flying either at high altitudes or and or long distances to lean the mixture. All the book fuel consumption numbers are predicated on the mixture being leaned to whatever value they give. It might be 50 degrees rich of peak. You want to drain your fuel prior to flight to eliminate any uh, contamination. Another thing to think about is don't change your fuel selector immediately prior to takeoff or landing. Let's just say there's an issue with the fuel selector valve or the fuel or something in the fuel system on that other tank. It's really important that you have engine power for both takeoff and landing. And if you switch the tank and it's not, uh, let's just call it proven, you don't know for uh, there's something wrong with it, let's just say, and you, you won't be able to have any time to react should something go wrong. Couple tips about fuel handling, only use approved fuel tanks, hoses and pumps, and make sure you bond or ground the aircraft to the fuel supply. Because we're flying at altitudes, there is a chance that the aircraft can be at a different potential than the uh, fuel fueling system. And when we touch the fuel nozzle to the aircraft, if the potentials, the electrical potentials are different, you could potentially create a spark. 8087 fuel is obsolete, it's red, 100 LL, it's the standard avgas now, it is blue colored. 10130 is green, it's also obsolete, and Jet A is straw colored. You can go up in octane, but you cannot go down. Detonation occurs when fuel explodes in the cylinders as opposed to burns slowly, and vapor lock occurs when fuel turns to vapor, blocking liquid fuel, such as a hot start uh, or a hot engine that won't start. When you're fueling the aircraft, it's important that you ground the aircraft uh, to prevent a static discharge. An engine requires 100 LL fuel, but 100 LL fuel is not available. Which fuels can be substituted? So remember, we can always go up, we can only go up in octane, so there'll be 100, 130. Jet A is not a gasoline. It's a jet fuel or similar to diesel or kerosene. So that would eliminate B and C, correct? So correct answer is B. When should fuel be strained? Immediately after fueling. B, immediately uh, prior to fueling, but before flight. C, after fueling. D, any of the above. The correct answer in this case is prior to fueling, but before flight. The reason for that is we want to get rid of any contaminants in the fuel system. Once, we, once we're fueling the aircraft, what will happen is the fuel in the tanks will be quite turbulent and disturb any of the water or sediment that has accumulated in the low spots of the tank. And so we want to do it before we fuel and uh, ensure that we get all of that contaminant out. You have returned from a flight and are attempting to start the engine after picking up a passenger. The engine won't start. What is the likely cause and what do you do? So remember, this is uh, most likely vapor lock. Uh, caused by vapor in the fuel system, preventing liquid fuel from getting to the engine. And you want to follow the hot start procedure in the pilot operating handbook. And generally what they'll say is you want to lean the mixture and have the throttle in. So C is correct.
On the long cross country, what is the biggest risk of not leaning the mixture? A, fuel starvation. Uh, yeah, that's correct. That is a big risk uh, because you are going to be using up to 50% more fuel uh, than you had planned. B, detonation. Uh, nope, that's if you have the mixture too lean. C, vapor lock. Uh, nope. D, carbon deposits on spark plug. So you, you will get carbon deposits on the spark plug if you don't lean the mixture over many flights. Uh, but that's not a, a really a risk. That's more of a maintenance issue. So the correct answer is A, fuel starvation. That concludes this lesson on the fuel system and fuels. Thanks for joining me, and we'll talk to you in the next lesson.